Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. My name is Pete Blome, and I'm the chair of the Libertarian Party of Okaloosa County. It's our great pleasure tonight to host Mr. Ed Brady of the American Dream Coalition. I hope you're looking forward to this presentation as much as I am. Of course, events like this one don't happen by themselves. Before I continue, I would like to acknowledge the indispensable help of Mr. Sky Monte, the LPOC secretary, Mr. Andrew Pinelli, the LPOC treasurer, Mr. Steve Carrithers, who first proposed hosting Mr. Brady, and Mr. Carl Denninger, without whom we wouldn't be here right now. Please let me uh, tell you a little bit about Mr. Ed Brady. Ed Brady is the executive director of the American Dream Coalition. Ed served two terms as a city commissioner of Gainesville, Florida, from 2002 to 2008, where he was known as an outsider on the inside, who vigorously defended property rights, private enterprise, and limited government. As a member of the Gainesville City Commission, he deliberated on numerous policy matters affecting growth management and comprehensive planning, and was a member of the Metropolitan Transportation Planning Organization and the North Central Florida Regional Planning Council. As director of the American Dream Coalition, Coalition, Ed has written on growth management and land use matters in national journals like New Geography and American Thinker, and has been interviewed about transportation issues on the PBS NewsHour. He frequently speaks to local and regional organizations about urban policy, especially as it relates to housing, land use, transportation, and the purpose of government at local levels. Without further introduction, Mr. Ed Brady. Thank you, Pete. All right. Basically, all that just meant I learned uh, how the sausage gets made and what it looks like when it's getting made. Um, I actually want to begin uh, with a fairy tale. No, it's not my fairy tale, and neither is it your fairy tale, but it is the fairy tale of our self-styled progressive friends who believe that it is their job to save us from ourselves and who want to use governmental power at the local level to do it. You see, in this fantasy, your community is beset with fire-breathing dragons. That's right, dragons. Wicked, nasty creatures that create havoc, breathe out noxious fumes, and recklessly roam your streets, endangering pedestrians and harming your quality of life. These dragons have names. Ford, Chevy, and Toyota. And they even belong to tribes. The tribe of SUV, sedan, and the tribe to which my own pet dragon belongs, minivan. Now, to us, we call these things automobiles, but for hip mayors and urban planners and other elites, these personal mobility machines are dangerous dragons, and as any good Viking knows, dra dragons must be slain. Now, even friendly ones like the Prius of the tribe hybrid or the leaf from the new tribe of EV, um, they too must go. And of course, there's always the dragon puff, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Now, this is not really about dragons or cars, of course. Rather, this is about self-determination in a free society. It's about property rights, and it's about what I call big government in your backyard. My name is Ed Brady, and I'm the executive director of the American Dream Coalition. We're a nonprofit 501c3 organization that bridges the gap between scholarly research in the think tank and academic world and the boots on the ground grassroots activists and other concerned citizens who want to restore our country to its founding principles and make the opportunity of the American Dream available to all. We're on the web at americandreamcoalition.org and I urge you to go on there and dig around. And I'm honored to speak to you tonight. I want to thank Pete for inviting me and uh, also Steve Carrithers for his initial outreach. I also want to thank your state chairman, Adrian Wiley, who I've had several conversations with, and I expect the American Dream Coalition will be working with libertarian chapters around the state to develop a strategy for the local level. Now, people sometimes ask, what do you mean by the American Dream? Well, this is our American creed, and so therefore it can mean different things to different people. For some, the American Dream is watching your kids go off to college and then renting out the room so that they can't come back. Now for others, it's 
starting your own business and, and having the chance to become your own boss. But regardless, it always begins with freedom. The freedom of the individual to choose how they pursue happiness. Now, as an organization, the American Dream Coalition begins with freedom and turns its attention to values that are not as uh, focused in the political world as we think it should be. Mobility and affordable home ownership. Now, I'm going to take this in reverse order. Affordable home ownership is not the name of a federal program. That would be affordable housing. Affordable home ownership is therefore not a governmental program, but rather a market condition. Recognizing that in a free society, with as much abundant land as we have, developers will build homes that are affordable to the middle class without the need for risky mortgage financing gimmicks or federal programs called affordable housing. And when homes cease to become to be affordable and when housing bubbles burst and ruin the economy, then these are not the result of market failures, but instead of unnecessary governmental interventions. And our organization attempts to shine a light on that. Owning your own home is the way a great majority of Americans have always defined the American dream, stretching all the way back to the Jeffersonian ideal of the sturdy yeoman farmer, well-armed and living on his own land. This we defend. And speaking of Jefferson, the operative word in the phrase pursuit of happiness is pursuit, and that implies mobility. Your individual mobility to go where you want to go, when you want to go. We know mobility is important for economic reasons. It gives you better access to jobs and access to goods and services, but it's so much more. Of all the freedoms we have, mobility is the one most taken for granted. And as we'll get into, into it in a minute, it's also the one that is most currently under assault at all levels of government. Mobility enhances our quality of life and is directly tied to your freedom. Every trip someone takes results in a transaction that may not be important to a progressive elitist or a Marxist professor, but it's very important to the person making the trip. Think of your own mobility just in the month of July. Was it all about economics? Or was it also about social interactions, educational opportunities, civic and cultural experiences, religious and recreational participation? The things we value that help us define the American dream are under assault, and not just from President Obama, although he's doing a pretty good job of that on his own, but also from what I call big government in your backyard. Now, playwright David Mamet of Glengarry Glen Ross fame, who broke ranks with the left several years ago when he wrote a piece for the Village Voice entitled, quote, Why I'm No Longer a Brain Dead Liberal, is out with a new book called The Secret Knowledge. Now, in this, he attempts to concisely describe in one sentence the problem of big government, its chronic overreach, its tendency to bully individuals, and ultimately come down on the wrong decision. So he says, think of your local zoning board, which is, of course, a function of local government. He says the federal government is the zoning board writ large. Well, the opposite of that is also true. Local government is the federal government writ small. That is, it's increasingly complex, expensive, wasteful, and enables the inexorable growth of the bureaucratic regulatory state. And it's driven by elitist visions of how others should live their lives, and it has lost sight of the principle that government, at any level, exists to serve the interests of the people, and not that people should serve the interests of government. Local governments, particularly city councils and county commissions, are expanding the regulatory state, imposing direct and indirect costs on citizens, and pushing wholesale changes to our way of living based on fads and theories. That is what we're up against, and that is what I'm glad to shine some light on. So where to begin? Let's begin with the structure of government at the local level. In the 67 counties of Florida, and in the vast majority of city councils and city commissions, we operate under what is called a council manager form of government. This allows for the elected officials to serve essentially in a part-time capacity, hire professional staff who then carry out the day-to-day -day operations. And it has its benefits, which is why it's pretty popular. Um, the first is the part-time access. 
it allows for access and opportunity. If you are just regular Joe or regular Jane, you have a chance to influence your local government. You can usually corner your local official at the grocery store and you can petition government for redress or grievances in the evening because most major decisions are carried out in the evening because of the part-time nature. It also allows you the opportunity to run for office also as a regular citizen, which is what I did myself in 2002. But it does have some drawbacks. And one of the drawbacks is, in a sense, also a virtue. You have a professional staff that's trained to carry out the day-to-day -day operations. And the problem with this is the issue of specialization. Now, traditionally, in a, the way we understand a government from our eighth grade civics lesson, is that the people are on top, they elect the elected officials who hire the staff, and then they implement policy. But with a, under the council manager form of government and under the structure of uh, the substructure of local government, it works a little differently. You have uh, associations and advocacy groups, and associations are like the American Planning Association and the International City Count County Managers Association and the Congress for the New Urbanism. And they team with advocacy groups like the Sierra Club and like the Thousand Friends of Florida and they influence and even educate the professional staff who then educates, with scare quotes, the elected officials who then rush to push policy through with or without the citizens being involved at all. And that is essentially what we have. The issue of spe specialization is understandable because people who aspire to be managers of major cities have to climb the chain. And it's a very similar to an academic enterprise where your peers, therefore, are not the people you serve with in that organization, but people in other communities in a similar capacity. And so you share notes. You see what others are doing, and you also learn that to climb the ladder, you have to do the things that get attention. So one of the things that has been a downside of the city manager form of government specialization has been the enticement of public monuments, building expensive, gaudy things with more tax dollars that are not necessarily an essential service of government or even a core function. And the other major problem with this is that you get a bunch of people in the room with all the same backgrounds and they start thinking they know what's best for everyone else. And so local governments over time have evolved from being responsive to community needs to trying to become prescriptive of the community and therefore prescribing the way we should live our lives. These organizations and associations are many. Like I mentioned a few, the American Planning Association and the ICMA. You also have the Congress for the New Urbanism, the League of Cities, the Association of Counties, and the Conference of Mayors. With the, this type of substructure in place, all that has been needed to change the nature of governments locally has been a unifying philosophy or ideology. And it comes in the name of smart growth, which is also sometimes referred to as new urbanism. It is a comprehensive planning doctrine that is spread through these associations that many of your local officials attend annually. And certainly if you have professional staff, if you have planners and transportation engineers, they are certified through these organizations. Now, smart growth on its own terms doesn't sound that scary. Uh, what they say is that in general, quote, in general, smart growth invests time, attention, and resources in restoring community and vitality to city centers and older suburbs. New smart growth is more town-centered, is transit and pedestrian oriented, and has a greater mix of housing, commercial, and retail uses. And they say the goal of smart growth is simply to reverse the pattern of suburban development and automobile orientation. But in practice, smart growth leads to draconian restrictions on property owners and businesses, and their prescriptive land use regulations allow politically favored developments in some areas and prohibits it in others. And it imposes strict and expensive conditions on even the projects it approves, resulting in economic stagnation and housing unaffordability. The 
characteristics of smart growth are things that you see come together in communities like this in bits and pieces. The push for higher urban densities to keep people from spreading out and moving into the suburbs. The focus on mixed use and compact development with the hope that people will be able to work where they live and where they play so that they won't have to get in the automobile. Compact development so we can crowd more people into tiny apartments as opposed to living on single family homes out in the suburbs. And of course the linchpin of it all is transit, a heavy focus on transit, taking it away from its historic useful purpose of providing transportation to people who cannot or should not drive and instead trying to make it a catalyst for re-engineering your community so that people will leave the cars behind and take the bus or better yet take light rail. Now the history of smart growth goes back to the 1946 Town and Country Act of Great Britain because as we all know if you're a progressive American you have to do what they do in Europe. And it started there and it metastasized into different variations over time so that by the 1990s it had gelled into sort of a unifying theory. Now this sometimes gets confused with another issue many of you may have heard of or are familiar with and that is Agenda 21 which is part of a United Nations framework and yes local governments have a fixation on that too. But what's interesting is that there is a lot of overlap but they are distinct they may run parallel in some areas, particularly on the issue of sustainable development, but they originated differently. And I can say as a former elected official, I assure you, your local officials do not receive memos from the United Nations, but they do receive conference briefings, brief briefings and policy papers from the American Planning Association from Smart Growth America and from all these other substructural associations I had mentioned. So that is where we as an organization focus our attention because we see the influence on local governments coming from that source. Now in Florida smart growth was a perfect fit because the state had already uh, put in place if you will the scaffolding or the architecture to support it. That came with the 1985 Florida's Growth Management Act, adopted by the legislature in 1985, and it was adopted with good intentions. It's aimed at the time was to deal, because of rapid population increase, to deal with an inadequate infrastructure, environmental degradation, and affordable housing, interestingly enough, since what the Florida Growth Management Act did was basically run affordable housing. It also aimed to alleviate traffic congestion and, of course, prevent sprawl. However, it started with good intentions. The idea was only to coordinate different local communities so that they could you know, identify and share similar goals. But by the 90s, with the advent of smart growth, it had evolved from a coordinate, an agency that coordinated and integrated statewide goals into a command and control bu bureaucracy that uses its regulatory power to prescribe outcomes. Now fortunately, uh, the, the Growth Management Act uh, was somewhat defanged this past legislative session by the Florida Legislature and by Governor Rick Scott. Growth Management was um, housed in the Department of Community Affairs, which has been basically liquidated and moved into different areas, losing its regulatory functions. In February this year, I got to, ad I got to address the a Florida House Subcommittee on regulations and advocated its removal, so we're happy to have played a role in that. But where the state level takes you know, a nap, the federal government is always willing to step in and help. And they use, through their agencies of the EPA, DOT, and HUD, they have put forward a new plan, which they call the Livable Communities Act. Now the Livable Communities Act is definitely top-down central planning aimed at changing where we live and work and how we travel. It exemplifies the progressive idea of strategic diminishment and that is success is measured by the reduction of certain outcomes from today's standard. And where they put their emphasis is on 
vehicle miles traveled. The aim of many local governments now, uh, through the federal government, because of grants that are awarded, is to, re is to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Now, absent from their advocacy is any acknowledgement that cars are not just expressions of freedom, but also indispensable contributors to our prosperity. For example, automobiles enable us to have more access to goods and services, and that therefore it forces businesses to compete by offering higher quality and lower costs. If you've ever driven past one establishment to get a better deal at another, then you've personally benefited from mobility. But when tens of thousands of people do this within a metropolitan area, then that is fueling the creativity and innovation necessary in a market economy. Right before the bubble burst and the economy went into a recession, Americans traveled four and a half trillion miles by automobile. As a result of the economic recession, we traveled eight billion fewer passenger miles in 2009 than we did in 2008. And it's hard to see that the reduction of vehicle miles traveled during this time did anything good for our economic well-being. So how does smart growth work? Smart growth works by selling itself on usually catchy slogans. The very name smart growth implies that if you adhere to its tenets, you're smart. And if you're against it, you're not so smart. Other phrases come to mind like the Livable Communities Act. I certainly want to live in something that's livable. I don't know the operative negative form of that uh, uh, that would be the alternative to that. And then you have other phrases like multimodal and transportation choice and also complete streets. If your street doesn't have bus bays, rail transit, bike paths, and wide sidewalks, then by definition it's not complete and you're not experiencing a livable life. So rhetoric is an important part of selling smart growth. And if, if you're active in politics, you know most politicians are quite lazy and if it sounds good, they'll likely go for it. Which is also why smart growth has many advocates who are in the Republican Party who are ostensibly conservative, but they don't when they adopt policies like this. Another reason why smart growth sells is envy, particularly European envy. Now, I don't know how familiar, familiar you are with envy, but it is one of the seven deadly sins. I'm inclined to gluttony and sloth, but if you're a progressive elitist, I guess envy is what you want to do with yourself. But it's interesting when you look at Europe, you don't see exactly what they, uh, what they advocate. In the United States, about 85% of travel is by the automobile. Over in Europe, where they say everyone walks or takes rail, automobile travel accounts for 79% of all travel. So it's a difference of just six percentage points. And also, with the fall of the uh, Soviet Union and the freeing of Eastern Europe, a new phenomenon is developing in countries like Poland and Czechoslovakia, former Czechoslovakia and other places, and that is the development of suburbs. So, ironically, as much as our leaders here want us to become more like Europe, Europe is actually becoming more and more like America as they try and enjoy economic prosperity and their own European dreams. So another element that's really important to understand why smart growth works its way into communities is fear. Fear. H.L. Mencken once said, the aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed and hence ready to be led to safety by menacing it with an endless series of hob hobgoblins and all of them imaginary. And in smart growth, the great hobgoblin is sprawl. Now, have you heard the term sprawl? Do we know what sprawl really is? I know what sprawl is. Sprawl is anything that is built behind where I live. Because the way it works is where you live is fine. But anything behind you is sprawl, unnecessary development, and should be stopped. As a, when I was a candidate running for office in 2002, I was coming to term with these different terms of the vernacular of local government. And I remember knocking on doors in, in a far suburban neighborhood of Gainesville. 
and you know talked about public safety and roads and stuff like that only to be told by the lady in the house that she's only going to support candidates who promise to stop sprawl and I looked at her and I said ma'am maybe I'm wrong here but from what I've read you are sprawl and uh, she did not take a yard sign but I won anyway the point is sprawl is in is one of those things that's almost in the eye of the beholder it's typically defined as low density development, single use development, such as single use suburbs. But we used to not always think so negatively about suburbs. We even made shows about suburbs. And the real critical point is that, is that suburbs or sprawl is the home of home ownership. It's because of the, avail the historic availability of cheap land on the urban edge that people have been able to build homes that are affordable to the middle class. Once communities start reining that in, you see housing prices skyrocket. There's also some interesting facts that get in the way of the smart growth narrative. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, all urban areas of 2,500 people or more occupy less than 5% of the land in the United States. Randall O'Toole, who founded this organization, the American Dream Coalition, he's now a senior fellow at the Cato Institute in Washington, and O'Toole's calculated the numbers and population and square and acreage, and he says if every family built a home on a quarter acre lot, they could all, all fam families in America could comfortably fit in the state of Ohio, leaving everything else as one giant pocket park. And another historian, Robert uh, Brugman, University of Chicago, has said that when looking at this phenomenon of sprawl all across the world, what he has concluded is that in every society where people have the freedom of choice, the pattern of land use is to decentralize and spread out over time. Smart growth attempts to reverse that through expensive retrofits. And there are many negative consequences to that. One of which, of course, is housing costs, which, as I already mentioned, go, have gone up. And a curious uh, element of the housing bubble that burst was that the bubble itself was not universally, was not spread evenly. It happened in states with, state, with, growth, with uh, statewide growth management laws like Florida, like Hawaii like Maryland, like Oregon. It did not happen in states without growth management laws like Texas and Kansas and Missouri and some of these other states. As a result, housing prices went up, but not much in uh, non-smart growth states, but they did skyrocket in smart growth states. But of course, when the bubble burst, it affected the national economy because by that time, politicians had tried to put a band-aid over a bleeding wound and basically with through risky mortgage financing instruments and others they exacerbated the problem as a result there's now a slight decline in home ownership and this isn't an argument that everyone should be a homeowner there's a time and place for everything but as an ideal we still think it has great value unfortunately that may take a serious um, have, have a serious in negative impact as a result of our recent economic downturn. So smart growth doesn't work in keeping housing affordable, but it also doesn't work on even the things they say are important. Because similar to the folks who are uh, interested in the Agenda 21 issue, with smart growth they want to save the environment by reducing carbon emissions. And regardless of where you are on the issue of man-made global warming or whatever, it's important to understand that if you have political leaders who are imposing regulations to affect a specific outcome, whatever that outcome is, you need to know if it works. In Australia, they actually did a land inventory of carbon emissions and they measured every gram of carbon front to its source. They associate to its source and what they concluded was that actually the outer rings had the lowest per capita carbon output of any type of land use pattern. The highest carbon output per capita was the inner city, the central city, higher density areas. Now, when you stand back, you say, how is that possible? You crowd a bunch of people in, it shouldn't cost as much. But I don't know about you, but the, uh, the elevators and escalators necessary to move people in high density cities 
are probably using a lot more energy than the elevators and escalators in my single family suburban neighborhood. And so a lot of public spaces are not calculated into the equation. Once they calculate it, they learn that uh, higher densities does not necessarily reduce carbon. Another example on the transportation side is Paris. Because again, addressing what the progressives want to address, the European envy. Paris added light rail to the third ring of its city, aiming to relieve traffic congestion. After a year, they calculated the numbers and found that Paris added more than 3,000 tons of carbon into the atmosphere as a consequence of light rail. Why? Well, because over 90% of light rail users were former bus riders. They didn't get anybody out of the cars. All they did was create more traffic. So cars stalled in traffic pollute a lot more. In Portland, which if, you're, if you follow local politics, you know local planners love Portland, Oregon. They have the award-winning Orenco Transit-Oriented Development. It's where you can live, work, and play and take the bus wherever you want to go. Researchers at Lewis and Clark University looked into it after several years and found that it had not made any appreciable effect on driving. People moved there for the status symbol of living in the, quote, award-winning Orenco station. Did I mention it was transit-oriented? And then finally, Maryland was which one of the states that pioneered smart growth. In fact, its governor, Paris Glendening, coined the phrase smart growth. And after 10 years, the University of Maryland's smart growth research wing found that it has failed to stop any of the things it claimed it was going to stop, namely sprawl. But one of the biggest, oh, and I can't miss this. The other problems with smart growth and high density is that it, it makes you nuts. Literally. Science, recent research in the journal Nature has found that cities have both health risks and benefits, but mental health is negatively affected. Mood and anxiety disorders are more prevalent in city dwellers, and the incidence of schizophrenia is strongly increased in people born and raised in cities. And as for transit, in San Francisco, a recent investigation of the BART rail transit system found the presence of fecal and skin-borne bacteria, including the potentially lethal MRSA. The study also found 245 incidences of urinating or defecating and 56 reports of spitting last year. I call that vibrant urbanism. Anyway, the solutions that are being pitched don't work. And then, of course, one of the greatest impacts is on private property rights. Under smart growth, we have granted a lot more regulatory power to government, but we've seen a dramatic weakening of private property rights. Uh, the governor I mentioned, Paris Glendening, had, has uh, on record saying that, quote, property rights are a heated issue. I don't believe the political re realities allow you to go to a stronger system of smart growth. And in 2005, the Washington Post framed the issue this way, quote, anti-sprawl laws, property rights collide in Oregon. And of course, property rights are not just a foundational freedom, they're an indispensable tool of economic empowerment. According to the Heritage Foundation's Index of Economic Freedom, nations that protect property rights and other forms of economic freedom have per capita incomes at least six times greater than nations with little or no economic freedom. Now, as a country, though, we are slowly surrendering property rights to a culture of planning. James Masson said that he is more, he says, a greater threat to our liberty is not from outside intrusion, but through the gradual and silent encroachments of political power, essentially. But with the property rights butting heads with a planning culture, one of the, I think, one of the worst aspects of it is how it shifts the presumption of right. We've gone from owning our property, essentially, to leasing our property. In a culture of property rights, you have the presumption of responsibility. Their presumption is that you're not going to be irresponsible. You're going to maintain your property and do good things with it. The exception to the rule is just that. It's an exception. The rule is people are responsible. In fact, owning property encourages responsible behavior. Under a culture of planning, you get the exact opposite. 
the presumption is that you're going to do something bad with your property, so we've got to burden you with layers of regulations to greatly restrict what you're able to do. So the culture of planning, which is gradually taking over, is undermining not just the property rights itself, but the value that, under, that underlies private property and what it begins, what it does. Which brings us to the, one of the last areas to get into. So why are local governments still pushing it? Well, lots of people in government like power. They like control. And they do believe they know what's best for people like you and me. And when it comes to the fact that these issues don't work, they really don't care. There is an academic, there's actually a term in the planning literature called strategic misrepresentation. In an article entitled Policy and Planning for Large Infrastructure Projects, the authors looked at major local projects and they concluded that, quote, planners and promoters purposefully spin scenarios of success and gloss over the potential for failure. Again, this results in the pursuit of ventures that are unlikely to come in on budget or on time or deliver the promised benefits. Now, I'm not sure about you, but strategic, the strategic misrepresentation sounds a lot like lying to me. But you give it a sort of an academic gloss, and there you go. But nonetheless, that is a term that is legitimately used in the planning literature. But it's not just strategic misrepresentation, it's also strategic diminishment. By accepting a vision of the planners who know what's best for us, we are accepting a diminished quality of life. We are turning responsibility over to others. So, and, and unfortunately, this regulatory power is stretched through many different associations that I've mentioned. You have APA. MPO, CRA, ICMA, CNU, EPA, HUD, and DOT. It's enough to make me say WTF, which I mean winning the future, which was President Obama's State of the Union address, right? By winning the future, there are some good things that are happening. Currently, there is a House bill in the U.S. Congress that, if passes, will strip out the smart growth grants from the Environmental Protection Agency. Let's hope it passes. And, of course, recently, Governor Rick Scott vetoed the high-speed rail project, which would have made people up here pay for business travelers and tourists to take a, tr a train that would have averaged just 76 miles per hour uh, between Orlando and Tampa, and quite frankly, I can top that on a good day. Now, the ADC, our organization, American Dream Coalition, was in a, uh, a bit of a fight last year in Tampa, Hillsborough County over a light rail sales tax initiative. Working with the Tampa Tea Party, we, uh, we came in, brought speakers, and they were able to successfully defeat light rail in Tampa which even though it sounds like that's a Hillsborough County issue, quite frankly, would have to be subsidized for the simple reason that all rail projects are heavily subsidized, which means you would be paying for people to take the train between Ybor City and downtown Tampa. So there has been some good news. And the other things that we suggest is that for groups like the Libertarian Party of Okaloosa County is to run for office, groom candidates and run for office. Engage locally because the good news is that you can make a difference at the local level. It's hard to get your U.S. Senator on the phone. You can track down your county commissioner and your city, your city councilman. And if they're not doing the job you think they should, you can replace them. And so that is something that is within your power to do. So if you're in the fight for liberty now, then, then you are actually someone who's inherited the American Revolution. And whether you're first generation born or your ancestors came across on the Mayflower, the blood of Paul Revere and Patrick Henry is coursing through your veins. And you have a responsibility to get in the game and to challenge big government, whether it's in Washington, Tallahassee, or even in your own backyard. The American Dream Coalition is proud to be in the fight for liberty with the Okaloosa Libertarian Party. We're dedicated to this purpose and can provide you with basic training for defending liberty at the local level for defending property rights, for promoting private enterprise and entrepreneurship, for defending mobility and home ownership, 
for opposing excessive regulations in this planning agenda called Smart Growth. In fact, another colleague of yours, Clint Shivers, and I met to discuss developing a list of specific local issues we can develop together and so that you, the activists here in this community, can tackle it, tackle it and bring big freedom to your backyard. I look forward to working with you on this, and I thank you again for your time tonight. Where's my water? There's the water. I don't know if we have time for questions, if anyone had any. Oh, okay, good. If we do, that's fine. Okay, no, no, I thought I'd present the plan. That, that works. <laughs> okay, on, the, on behalf of the Libertarian Party of Okaloosa County, I'd just like to present a very simple plaque in appreciation All right. for you coming tonight. Uh, you've been a real trooper. I have to say that in the two years that we've been in this locale, this is absolutely the most noisy night that we've ever been here. <laughs> That's so all right. I can't, you know, it's Murphy's Law at work. So I'd like to present this plaque right. to you in appreciation for coming here and speaking as you have.